I am Michael Brad Bayless, founder of Bayless Healthcare. Today, we have parenting skills training as a preventative intervention technique. Our presenters are Colleen Carr and Mikey Jensen. Working with parents along with working with children is a very important aspect of total intervention. I hope you enjoy our didactic training session. We're going to be doing a didactic presentation today on parenting skills training as a preventive intervention technique and also something that you all could maybe use in your individual sessions with um, children, family, clients. So the, um, we have expertise in this in the sense that we both work at the Prevention Research Center at Arizona State University and we work on two separate projects that are family focused and have a big parenting skills training component um, specifically. So I work on the New Beginnings program, which is a program for parents that are going through separation or divorce, and it teaches these parents parenting skills. So it's a 10-session program that's focused on both group didactics and practice of how to use the skills with kids at home. And the biggest part of the program is really homework, so having the parents go home and use these skills with their children um, and work on improving the parent-child relationship. And we've been doing research on this program for over 15 years, and it's found to be very effective long-term um, in reducing child internalizing and externalizing and substance use. Um, and it, it's just had great effects. We're, we're still studying these kids now that they're, um, you know, about 24 to 27, and the program is still very effective for them long-term. Um, one thing to note is that initially we'd started with having this program be both a parenting component and a child component and we learned that the child component didn't add anything. What was really effective was the parenting component alone. So the message here is just that by intervening and changing parenting strategies, you're able to influence child outcomes. And so I work on the Bridges to High School program, or Puentes a la Secundaria, and so it's a family intervention. So it has an adolescent component, a parent component, and a family component, and it's nine weekly sessions. And so um, it's designed specifically for Mexican origin families here in the Valley, was where it was developed. Um, but the skills are applicable across race or ethnicity. Um, it's just been tested in Mexican origin families because that's a population that's been understudied and underserved. And um, we did integrate some more family values and things that might be extra helpful to Mexican origin families. Um, it has long-term outcomes through young adulthood, so we've just finished collecting data through when the kids are early 20s, young adulthood, and we have effects on internalizing, externalizing, substance use, and it looks like school dropout, um, which is an important outcome too. We haven't published that yet though. Um, and it looks like actually when we do mediational analysis that the effects of this program on child outcomes are largely mediated by those parenting skills. And so the parent component how it works is so it's nine weekly sessions and the kids meet in the group together, the parents meet in a group together and they all come together at the end for a family session. And it seems like that parent component is a very strong piece. So we're talking about this because parenting skills are sometimes referred to as like a universal intervention. I've heard them re referred to as like inoculation for just any group of people because they can be helpful even if you don't have a really problem behavior child. Um, and they usually target things like family interactions, good listening skills, discipline strategies, and effective discipline. And then we're also going to talk about some of these divorce-specific parenting strategies that might be a little bit different than um, a universal strategy, but are still really helpful to a lot of families. So I'm going to talk a little bit about positive family interactions. And a lot of these things are things that I've used with many of my child clients. So just think when you're, when you're listening to this about how these skills might apply to some of your cases. So, okay. The first way that you can help people strengthen their families is by helping them establish new family routines. And family routines are really important, especially um, with families that are experiencing changes like divorce, uh, because they show kids that their lives are predictable and that they have certain things that they can count on. Examples of family routines are things like sharing meals together, having a bedtime routine, or having special movie nights or game nights or something that you do on a regular basis, or attending religious services, just things that enable children to 
anticipate what's going to happen in their lives. One way to establish a routine is to have special time, which is individual time you spend, a parent spends with their child for 15 minutes each week. And the goal of special time is to help children feel connected to their parents and to show children that they really matter to their parents, that their parents want to know what's going on in their lives and just want to spend this special time with them. So the idea of special time is that it's something that's an official routine so children know, you know, special time is going to happen on Monday evening or something and you call it special time and the parent announces it to the child, it's our special time now, what do you want to do? The child gets to choose the activity and the idea is that during this time the parent is just giving positive attention and just showing unconditional positive regard. So this isn't a time for teaching or criticizing or asking a lot of loaded questions, it's just a time to let your child play what they want to play and just kind of follow along with what they're doing. A few more details that I, I mentioned already about special time. It's important for parents not to teach or criticize or give commands. Um, it's just a time to follow their lead. So if a child is misbehaving during this time, parents should just try to ignore it and maintain the special time together. If it becomes such a huge problem, you can suggest to parents that they end the special time and try it again. And it's important for parents to just emphasize that they really enjoyed the time and that they want to do it again, that this is really going to become a meaningful routine for the family. One thing to keep in mind is that this special time is very different for younger children and for older children. One way it differs is the kind of activities that you might suggest that parents try with their kids. Keeping in mind that kids get to choose the activities, but sometimes it helps for parents to have some ideas in mind to suggest to kids if they can't come up with something. So for younger children, some good activities are drawing or playing a game, building with blocks, playing house. And one thing that you can suggest parents do with younger children is act like a sportscaster. So what parents do is they describe or narrate what their child's doing. So if the child's drawing a picture, the parent might say, oh, you know, I see you're, you're drawing a house and a dog. And just to show your child you're paying attention and you're really attuned to what they're doing. And like we, I mentioned, it says here, you know, you're drawing a blue dog. So one thing that parents should keep in mind is that this isn't a time for corrections or criticism. So you wouldn't say to your three-year-old, oh, is the dog really blue? You'd just be like, oh, that's a really great blue dog you're drawing. So the way that special time looks different with older children is that the activities might be a little different. So it might be more like going for a walk or cooking together or talking. Just, it can be just talking. Um, playing a card game or having a, your child teach you how to play a game. So just have parents keep in mind the age appropriateness of the activities that they're doing. And with older children, parents shouldn't act like a sportscaster because older children would probably find that annoying for the parent to be commenting on their every move. Um, so the parent should still follow the child's lead and kind of just do what they want to do, however they want to play the game, whatever they want to draw, um, but not do the sports casting. And with all children, no, no teaching questions or criticizing. You can ask questions, but not you know, leading loaded questions. Another routine that I use with a lot of my families to increase positive family interactions is family time. And again, this is a special routine time. So it's like a one to two hour time that a family sets aside each week to do something special together as a family. And the goal is to increase positive family interactions and to help start a new family tradition. And it should be an activity that everybody in the family wants to do. The kids choose it like with special time. It should be inexpensive, so it's something that the family can really maintain doing every week. You don't want to make it some big trip. Um, it should be something small, like going to the park or something like that. It should be something active, so it shouldn't be watching TV or going to a movie or doing something that the family can't really interact while it happens. It should be more like something like a board game, something that really sets the stage for the family to, to have a conversation and to have active fun together. 
one rule you can tell parents that they can set for their kids is that there's no complaining, whining, or fighting during family time. This is a time for the family to spend positive time together where they're not criticizing each other or arguing. Um, some ideas for family fun time are listed on this slide if you want to quickly look over them. As you can see, all of these things are inexpensive things that are active and um, you know, it's important to keep in mind that they're age appropriate for all of the people in your family and that they're things that everybody would enjoy. And one thing that I like to suggest to families about family time is to get the whole family together to come up with ideas for what they want to do for family time and to write those ideas on little note cards or something. The ideas should be things that everybody agrees, yes, we're willing to do this. Then you stick them in a bowl, and when it's time to do family time, you pull one out. Um, so you have kind of a fun way to pick what you're going to do. And it also helps with family time to suggest to parents that they pick a specific time that they know is going to work every week. So like Friday night is our family time, and everybody knows to expect it, and it becomes truly routine. Another way to increase positive family interactions is catch them being good. Um, so this is a way for parents to show children the ways they want them to behave. So you catch them being good by giving children praise for the things that they do. And it can be verbal praise or it can be um, showing children in nonverbal ways like by giving them a hug or a pat on the back or a high five. And when you catch them being good, you want to be very specific and Parents should tell children exactly what they like that their child is doing. Like, oh, thank you so much. You did a great job picking up the toys and putting them in that box. I really appreciate that. And you want, the parents want to catch them right when they do it so the child really sees the connection between what they do and their child's praise. And parents shouldn't be stingy with catch and being good. They should praise their children as often as they can so their children feel appreciated and know what their parents expect of them. One thing to remember not to do when you catch them being good is to give backhanded um, compliments or praise with, we call it praise with a kick, which is kind of adding a criticism to the compliment you give. So something like, oh, I see you cleaned your room. Maybe next time you could do it the first time I asked or something like that, which parents you know, tend to do. And an added benefit, I feel like, of catch them being good is that sometimes, so it seems like something you would want them to do all the time, but when you assign catch them being good as a homework, I feel like sometimes parents realize how little they actually compliment their children and how much they focus on the negative. So it's almost a good just awareness building thing in addition to the benefits of catching and being good. That's true. It also helps parents be more aware of the good things that their children do right. because parents often are attending to the problematic behavior instead of the good behavior. So that's a good point. So the second group of skills that we're going to talk about are these listening skills. Um, which you as therapists all probably have a pretty good handle on, but we would like to impart some of those skills to these parents. Um, the benefits of having good listening skills as a parent include helping children feel more co connected to their caregivers. Um, it really helps in the development of a respectful relationship. Um, the one benefit is that it makes children feel more comfortable sharing and confiding in their parents, really building that connection between parent and child fosters a relationship that'll be good in the future for things like sharing especially when a problem comes along. And then it also helps parents understand the child's problems because they're actually listening. So what is this all about? Um, so the first guideline is that you, when you listen, you really want to listen. So you want to show the child that you're ready and available. Um, body language is really important. So turn towards the child, eye contact, set down whatever else you're doing. So it's really, really clear to the child that the parent is listening. Um, and then asking open-ended questions um, is a great way to get this started. So what did you do at school? Did you have a good day at school? It's more of a yes, no. So you want to make sure that the child can expound upon whatever they're going to share with you. And then we also refer to these use say mores, which are things that as therapists you all do too. So just brief phrases or things that you could you know, slip in that show the child that you're really listening and encourage more talking, because that's the goal. So some examples of say mores. So the child's talking and you say, oh, tell me more about that. Or mm -hmm, just any verbal or nonverbal signal that shows this child that, oh my gosh, my parent is super paying attention to me. So nodding can serve that purpose as well. 
Um, it's also good for parents to use summary statements, which is just another way to show the child that they're understanding what he or she is trying to say. So um, pretty much paraphrasing what the child says. Um, it seems like you're saying checking in, making sure that you've got it right. Um, another thing that's really important and I think that parents sometimes don't think to do is including feelings statements or feelings discussion in these um, listening skills with their kids. So feeling statements would show a child that the parent is really trying to understand how he or she feels, which is oftentimes what a child is really looking for. So, um, and it can encourage the child to understand and talk more about his or her feelings in the future too, not just in this interaction. So if there's any emotional content to what the child is saying, a parent can use a feeling statement and check it out. So, and just guess. So it sounds like you may be feeling mad or sad. Is that right? And the kid will correct the parent if they're wrong. But um, it shows the child that this is something that matters and they should feel open sharing. A really important listening skill for parents that I feel like comes up a lot are um, dealing with quick fixes. So it's really tempting when you're listening, <laughs> you know, you're really dedicated to listening as a parent to get pulled into trying to fix whatever the child is sharing. So um, the child is talking and shares some experience and you're like, oh my gosh, I should tell them how to fix that because the parent, usually that's their job. And so in this kind of a sense, though, quick fixes actually prevent good listening. So quick fix would be giving advice or a solution before really understanding what's going on and giving the child to share, a chance to share. So um, we usually advise parents to listen first because sometimes the kid really does just want to talk or vent and doesn't really need you to fix it for them. Um, and in fact, if you were to provide a quick fix, you might miss important information. You don't give the child that chance to really get out what they wanted to get out. And um, you might cut them off, which probably would discourage talking in the future. Um, and then just on quick fixes, it's really good to maybe practice with parents, like with some scenarios that might pull for a quick fix, because it's so obvious when you see it in practice um, that parents immediately jump to the kid comes home and says, oh, you know, I was being teased at school today, and mom immediately launches into, well, you know, I told you, you should talk to your teacher when that happens. And, but really what the kid is trying to share is that this was a really frustrating experience and that that listening doesn't end up happening. Um, so this is, um, the next strategies we're going to talk about are effective discipline, which is kind of like when the positives aren't enough. <laughs> so noncompliance develops over time. Um, as you all know, it has contributions from many areas. So the child's personality, the parent's personalities, um, stress, and then even parenting style. And there are family cycles that contribute to these patterns of interaction and communication over time. So the most common pattern you'll see is a coercive cycle, where the parent and child are locked in this battle. Um, and it really just becomes the way the family works. So this is a good example we like to use. So say the parent says, it's time for bed, which most parents at some point or another have to say. And the child says, well, I don't want to. And the parent proceeds to escalate a little bit and says, no, you need to go now. It's bedtime. The kid um, picks up a toy, throws it, or threatens to throw it. Um, so the parent grabs the child's hand and says, stop. The child uh, starts freaking out, tries to bite the parent's hand. So the parent releases that hand and storms off, and the kid goes back to playing. So what happened there? Um, both people got reinforced, actually. So the child escaped the activity and didn't have to go to bed. Which, so they learned that throwing a tantrum actually works. And the parent escaped the tantrum by withdrawing. So they got reinforced, and so they'll be more likely to withdraw the next time. But the end goal, which we wanted to be going to bed, never happened. So the conflict actually just escal escalated, and we never got to that desired outcome. So um, this increases the likelihood that the parent and the child will both resort to these negative and extreme behaviors sooner than the next time. And it's going to lead to less parent patience, less fun together, and the children will withdraw ultimately. So that begs the question, how do we end this kind of a persistent power struggle between parent and child? So um, the goals we usually have are to increase positivity in these kinds of interactions, to develop clear and realistic expectations, to communicate those expectations to the child, um, adopt consequences that fit the misbehavior, and to be clear, calm, and consistent, the three C's, <laughs> with consequences. So we'll talk about these in a little bit more detail here. So first, let's talk about clear and realistic expectations. 
It's really important in a family context for the children to understand what the expectations for behavior are. And so the parent's job in this sense is to set realistic expectations. They should be age appropriate and they should be really consistent with the family values. Any rule that gets made should make sense for that family. And that's also why sometimes these expectations aren't necessarily transferable across families. It's important for the family to work on developing their own. So then these expectations need to be stated in a clear and really specific way. So the children need to be told exactly what a parent wants him or her to do. And then we want to be identifying um, behaviors, not qualities. So instead of telling your kid, be good, which what on earth could that mean? A lot of things. You want to say, be quiet during church, which is a behavior, like specifically what you're asking for right now. And that sets a clear expectation. And it's realistic. So here's some examples, and I'd like you all to share. So um, let me know if you all think these are expectations that are clear, and are they realistic? So a 12-year-old child should put his or her own dishes in the dishwasher after dinner every night. Clear? Realistic? I agree. <laughs> um, because it gives a time frame of when this should happen after dinner, and it's something that a 12-year-old can probably handle. How about a 4-year-old child should keep the playroom clean? Is it clear? No. Why not? It's like what's clean or clean enough, rather. And you're right, there's no um, specifics when, how much. And then is it realistic that a child should keep a playroom clean? I mean, all the time? Yeah, this is not very clear about when and how that should happen. How about an eight year old child should go to bed on time? Is it clear? No. <laughs> Why not? What time, right? Um, and how about realistic? Yes. It could be realistic if it was a little bit more clear about what that expectation was. How about a 16-year-old child should finish homework before watching TV? It's pretty clear um, the expectation is homework done before TV, and it's realistic. A 16-year-old should be able to handle that. So, um, Related to these clear and realistic expectations are how to give effective commands or directives to a child. And um, these can be really helpful to parents in group or individual settings. So they're based on those clear and realistic expectations. And so here you're going to be wanting to tell a child what to do, not what not to do. So instead of stop watching TV and clean up, you might want to say please turn off the TV and put the toys in the box. So do you see the difference there? You're not telling them just to stop doing something, but rather replacing that with what does need to happen in a specific action. Um, it's really important that you frame these as a command and not a question. So rather than, will you load the dishwasher? Which still has the option for the child to say no. <laughs> um, it's, please load the dishwasher. Um, and I think that that's actually a really important one, especially as kids get older. Um, they're much more willing to take questions as if they're optional. And um, I think it's important to give a warning. So say, in five minutes, I'm going to need you to please load the dishwasher so the kid can be ready for that and more likely to comply. Um, it's important that if you're going to choose to give a command, you only do it when you, can know, you know that you're going to be able to follow through. So you want to um, get your child's attention. So this is kind of a listening to so those things. You know, put yourself in front of them, reduce distractions, turn off the TV. Um, and then make eye contact so you know for sure the child heard you. Because I think that's actually an interaction I get into a lot with parents when they're talking about their child not complying. I'm saying, well, is it that they didn't hear you or pay attention the first time, or is it that they chose not to do it or just didn't? And I feel like often they're not sure because, you know, they shout it from the other room. It's just really easy to get into those kinds of habits. You want to make sure you're only giving one command at a time so it's super clear for the child to know what they're supposed to be doing. And it's sometimes helpful to ask the child to repeat it back to you so there's absolutely no question whether or not it was understood. Um, so, in general, it's usually better to do positive reinforcement for when these behaviors happen rather than punishment. So this should be the first resort for discipline. And sometimes praise is enough. If that child really does go load the dishwasher, um, you say, great, oh my gosh, I'm so proud of you for loading the dishwasher. Awesome. And often that's enough to get kids excited and have them do it the next time. It can sometimes help to create a reward system too, and lots of families need that more in place, broad system. So you can have them earn naturalistic or immediate rewards. 
Um, so for example, you load the dishwasher and you get dessert. And that's nice because um, it's immediate, so the child really knows that's coming. You can sometimes earn time for activities, so like you can earn TV time or internet time. I feel like in this day and age, internet time is becoming increasingly um, useful. I feel like all of my child clients, Facebook is an issue, and it comes up a lot. And so maybe regulating that and having it as a reward is helpful. They can earn money or allowance, and then sometimes it can be helpful to earn to tokens towards a larger incentive of choice. So I'm sure you all are f familiar with token economies, and these can be built into these same kind of systems. So as you all know, you can be creative with token economies. There's sticker charts, there's poker chips, there's magic jewels. Um, I have a child right now who's using beans and putting them in a jar. Um, and so it's really important that it's explained the system and the expectations are written down. So a family I'm doing this with right now, it's up on the board. You know, what are the expectations? Um, you want to start small, so reward one or two behaviors at a time. Keep it simple before the p families get overwhelmed. And it's important to let the child choose the reward so you know for sure that it's something that will be reinforcing to them. These are just some examples of token economies that people have done. So this is like a sticker chart, um, a jar full of poker chips, and then this is a more intense sticker chart. But the themes that are common across all of these are clear expectations. The child knows exactly what they'll get if they do these positive behaviors, and they know what they can change in those tokens for at the end. OK, so now we're going to talk about the three C's of effective discipline. And this is very related to when we're talking about effective commands and things like that. So the first of the three C's is to be calm. So you want to encourage parents when they're disciplining disciplining their children to do so when they can be calm about it and not to punish out of anger. So you want to suggest to parents that they never decide on the negative consequence when they're angry and parents can always say, you know, I'm very upset with you right now that you missed your curfew, we're going to talk about this later. And they can postpone it and put it off um, for a little bit until they can calm down. It's important to remind parents that the punishment should fit the child's misbehavior and not just their mood at the time. So often when parents punish when they're really angry, the punishment is too harsh, which leads to parents being inconsistent and increases negativity in the parent-child relationship. So you want to encourage your parents to stay calm and to give an appropriate consequence for the misbehavior. So like Mikey was talking about, parents should be very clear with their children when they're disciplining. So they need to communicate their expectations clearly. So like Mikey was saying with the sticker chart, when you write down exactly what you expect, you want to make sure that parents have clearly communicated to their children exactly what they're looking to see from them. Um, this helps children understand what's expected of them and sets them up to succeed because they know what they need to be doing. The consequences should also be clear. So parents need to be aware of exactly what they're going to do when their child meets their expectations or when their child fails to meet their expectations. And this is something that parents really should think about in advance, not just when a child does something bad, be like, oh, how am I going to handle this, but to really have a plan in mind for how to give positive and negative consequences. So the third C, which is very related, is consistent. So since parents have developed this clear idea of how they're going to handle um, children meeting expectations and not meeting expectations, then they need to actually follow through on it. So they should reward children each time an expectation is met. And rewards can be given through, it can be something like catch and being good, praise, um, and then sometimes there are more tangible rewards that are involved with meeting expectations. It's important when parents give tangible rewards to always also include praise. So it's not just giving whatever the token reward would be, but also telling them what they did that was so good. And to be consistent, parents should also provide a negative consequence when the expectations are not met. So without consistent follow through like this, children would push the boundaries. If they don't know that they're going to get punished, they might risk it. And if you don't, if parents don't follow through on giving negative consequences, children won't learn what the rules are. They won't really understand what's going on. And then they'll create this discipline cycle between parents and children. So the, the main message here for parents is to suggest to them that they really have a plan. 
for how they're going to respond. Like if they have a consistent problem that they're facing with the child, like my child misses curfew all the time, I need to sit down and think about what am I going to do when my child misses curfew? What am I going to do when he comes home on time? And then communicate that to the child. So, you know, if you are not home at 9 o'clock, you won't be able to go out tomorrow night or something like that. And it's important um, or it's useful when the consequence is related to the misbehavior. So something like that. If you miss curfew tonight, you can't go out tomorrow. So there's this direct link between the punishment and the misbehavior. So this is something that I use with my clients a lot, actually. It's the levels of consequences for discipline. So the idea here is that parents should use the lowest level consequence that works to address a misbehavior. So you don't want to do something major to address a minor problem because you need to save those major punishments for when something major happens. So let's talk about the first step here, which is ignoring. So I suggest that parents ignore minor misbehaviors like whining or tattling or interrupting when parents are on the phone um, because usually when children are engaging in those kind of behaviors, what they're looking for is attention. And by removing attention, parents aren't reinforcing the misbehavior. So in some cases, I suggest to parents that they tell their child that they're going to ignore them. So if it's something like a, the parent has made a decision that they've informed the child of, like, no, you can't go over to Johnny's house after school because you haven't done your homework. And the child keeps coming back, please, can I please go to Johnny's, can I please? I might say to the, suggest that the parent say, you know, I've already shared my decision with you. I'm not going to listen. We're not going to talk about this anymore. Just kind of say, I'm ignoring you now. But there are other cases where parents don't need to tell their child that they're going to ignore them. So like if the parent's on the phone and the kid keeps interrupting, the parent can just go ahead and ignore. So ignoring works to address a lot of these little misbehaviors. And the second step in terms of levels of consequences is increased supervision. So this is something that might be good for a misbehavior like a child not finishing their homework. Increasing parents increasing their monitoring of the child might work to address this misbehavior. So checking in with the child, you know, it might be something like if you're if the child um, isn't calling the parent to tell them where they go after school, the parent might be te have text um, text the child and ask the child to text a response. Just it's basically just increasing monitoring. And sometimes I feel like you, especially for teens, that extra monitoring is kind of aversive. Mm -hmm. Like they really don't want that and so they're willing to avoid it. Right, right, that's true. And um, then the next step is natural consequences. So this is basically the parent just not doing anything. So if the child refuses to eat the meal that the parents made, for example, the parent would just say, well, if you don't eat that, I guess you're just going to be hungry. And that's what happens. Or if the child if a child leaves his toys outside, and even though you've told them you need to put your toys away, and then the toy gets stolen or gets broken, the parent doesn't replace it. So it's just kind of letting things happen as they will and allowing your child to see, oh, when I leave my toy outside, it gets stolen. Or when I don't eat what my mom makes, I'm hungry. Um, so sometimes there aren't natural consequences for misbehavior, but when there are, those are good ones to use. Um, the next highest level consequence is removing privileges. So, um, and like I was saying, it's good to link the misbehavior with the privilege that's removed. So like if the child doesn't finish their homework before watching TV and that's the rule, they can't watch the TV show. So the privilege that's removed is very related and understandable to the child. Or like this one, if they come home late one night, the next night they have to come home earlier. And then the highest level consequence, which should be saved for serious misbehaviors like fighting or uh, skipping class or something like that, are to give something unpleasant. So that could be a timeout or a grounding, early bedtime, or an extra chore. And one thing to keep in mind is that some parents use spanking or physical punishment as something unpleasant to give. And I always suggest that there are more effective ways to give something unpleasant and that, you know, spanking sends the wrong message to children and that these approaches can be preferable. So in helping parents choose consequences that they should use, 
I suggest that they consider if the consequence really fits the misbehavior. Is it fair? It's really important to use the lowest level consequence that controls the misbehavior because parents don't want to just jump in and be mean and scary and ground their kid for whining. It just, it's just not the best way to do it. Um, you should save the big punishments for the big problems. And um, you should also suggest that parents consider if they can consistently give the consequence. Um, like if, can you think of an example? So I feel like it comes up with school stuff a lot. So in the sense that if a misbehavior is in a context where you actually have zero ability to enforce the consequence at that moment mm -hmm. or ability to know about it. So if the rule is don't, you know, give away your yogurt at lunchtime, I don't know, something that you have no idea whether it happens or not, that's probably not a very good thing to have a consequence about because you're not going to be able to enforce that. Oh, I just thought of one too. Or like, if you are going, to, if you say you're going to increase monitoring and you're going to really pay attention to when they're doing their homework and things like that, and you really can't be home in the evening to mm -hmm. do that, that wouldn't be the right consequence for you to pick. So they just have to make sure that it's something they can follow through on, so their children really know what to expect. And obviously, it's important to be clear with your child so that they really n understand what's going on, and so they have the opportunity to learn this link between their misbehavior and the consequence. Related to that, to that is the um, like don't punish yourself through the consequence. So I feel like you want to make sure it's something that if you do have to do this consequence, it's not going to be an awful thing for the parent to have to do. So monitoring can actually be super boring and unpleasant for a parent or um, well fine if you don't do that then I'm not going to do it either. Like the family loses out. That's probably not an awesome consequence because it has effects on the system too. Mm -hmm. Though sometimes, sometimes the misbehavior will get worse before it gets better because <laughs> kids will be testing the boundaries. So this happens a lot I, with ignoring, for example. If, when a parent ignores a child, at first they're going to just pester more and whine more, or do whatever they're doing more. Like, why isn't my parent responding? So I warn parents, this might get worse before it gets better. And some misbehaviors are pretty resistant to change. So just be patient with it. Be consistent. Show them you're going to keep ignoring them if they're whining and the child will learn uh, these links. So since my research is specific to divorce, there's some specific divorce related strategies that I want to share with you which are probably relevant to some of your child clients. So when parents are experiencing divorce, it often leads to some problems in the parent-child relationship. So starting by looking at the top here, after divorce, parents often feel out of control, stressed, depressed. They're going through a lot of changes and a lot of challenging emotions. And this tends to affect how they act towards their kids. So they might listen less, do fewer fun things. Um, parents after divorce are often less consistent in how they discipline and use harsher punishments. And as a result of the changes in parents' behavior, kids often feel angry or sad, insecure, have lower self-esteem. That affects how they act towards their parents, so they talk back more, argue more, pull away from the family. And it just creates this bad cycle between parents and children where it's bi-directional and it just continues to get worse. So by using a lot of the strategies that we've talked about today, you can encourage parents to perpetuate a positive cycle with their children. So when parents start to do more fun things with their kids, like the positive family interactions we talked about, like the family time and the special time and catch them being good, and when they use the listening skills that Mikey talked about, it affects how kids feel. They feel happier, more confident, more secure. They feel like their environments are more predictable. Then they talk back less to their parents. They have more fun time spent together. Then the parents start to feel happier and like they have better control over what's going on. And so it just perpetuates this more positive cycle in families. Another way to perpetuate the positive cycle besides the things that we talked about that's specific to families going through divorce is keeping children out of the middle of conflict between parents. So kids get put in the middle between parents who are separating and divorcing in obvious ways like when the parents are verbally fighting in front of the child, but it can also happen in more subtle ways like parents asking children questions about their, their ex-spouse. And parents might not see this as putting their children in the middle, but when they ask, you know, oh, is, is your mom still spending a lot of money or um, 
what's your dad's girlfriend like or something like that. It puts kids in an awkward position where they feel like they have to choose between their parents. Um, sometimes parents also say negative things about their exes in front of their children. A lot of parents feel like my child deserves to know the truth about their parent and it's important to remind these parents that you don't need to tell your child all the bad things that your ex did. They'll, they'll eventually kind of figure out the truth, but you don't need to be bad-mouthing your ex. Uh, another way that children get put in the middle a lot is when family or extended family or friends make negative comments about the child's other parent um, in front of that child. So there are a lot of tools that you can suggest that parents use to prevent children being caught in the middle. So one is anger management strategies. So this is just encouraging parents to be very aware of their triggers and when they're starting to feel angry and to use you know, relaxation skills like deep breathing um, to calm down and to prevent responding in an aggressive way. One thing we encourage parents to do is to use self-talk to stay calm. So to, to tell themselves why they shouldn't respond in a, in a violent or aggressive way. So saying something like, this isn't a good time to fight, my kids are here, or my children don't need to hear this, something like that. I, I can keep my children out of the middle. And it's obviously the goal here is just to keep children from being involved in conflict between the parents. So wait to discuss issues that might be problematic with your ex when your children aren't there. And when I mentioned that a lot of times other family members or friends are involved in this problem, one thing that parents can do is make requests of these individuals to not say negative things in front of their children about their ex-spouse, which can be kind of awkward. So it's important, you know, if you're asking, you know, your mother, stop talking badly about my ex in front of, of my kids to recognize that adult's feelings. So, you know, say, say to your mother, I understand that you're upset that my ex hurt me so much and, you know, I appreciate that you care, but my children really look up to you. They listen to what you say and it's hurtful to them to hear what you're saying about their father. Please refrain from saying negative things about him in front of my children. So by doing that, you recognize that adult's feelings, you understand that they're upset, you explain why you're making their requests, you don't want your children to hear these things, and you respectfully just ask for the change and say what you want them to do. I don't want you to talk about my children's father in front of them. And um, what I did also was acknowledge the importance of that individual to the children. So, you know, the children really listen to you, they really look up to you, they care about what you're saying, you're important to them. Oh, so that's all. <laughs> I have um, a question. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you do in the sense of when the parents in a divorce or separation and they're using the kid as a mediator? In other words, either the kid wants the parents to be back together again or one of the parents wants to get back together again with the other parent. And they utilize the kid to send those messages back to the other parent. And mm -hmm. I mean, they're trying to work out mm -hmm. the problems between each other, but through, the, through their kid. So what would you suggest in that sense? Well, I think that's two different issues, too. Like with the, the child wanting the parents to get back together, mm -hmm. I think that's where the good listening skills really come in mm -hmm. and just talking that through with your child and making sure that you're really listening and understanding what they're feeling and being very honest with them about the fact that you won't be getting back together. And then in terms of you know not putting kids in the middle, I think just explaining to parents how that makes children feel and how it confuses them and encouraging them to speak with their spouse separately from the children and just not getting the children involved at all. Right, because I see such a big overstep of boundaries mm -hmm. in that sense and you're giving this kid in the middle or their kid, you know, power mm -hmm. over a relationship, you know, and right. so I've yeah. seen that a lot. Yeah, I think just emphasizing the difficult position that that puts children in and the pain that that confusion can cause them. And just encouraging parents to use the self-talk to remind themselves that this isn't their child's responsibility, that this is something that they need to handle separately from their children. And parents who do that, I think it's important to emphasize to them that they're really setting that child up for... I mean, they could feel guilty if it doesn't actually get fixed, and they're, you're actually placing a lot of responsibility on that child and just being confused about whose job this is. Right. Um, this is reminding me of um, 
a case where the father, who was somewhat rigid, really didn't refused to acknowledge that he was saying anything bad about the mother. Mm -hmm. High conflict family, having to use a mediator to talk, really don't communicate with each other. And when the, the kids visit um, and complains about, say, something that the mother requested they did, didn't really agree, uh, he used to say, well, that's your mommy. Mm -hmm. But without really... Uh, he, you know, I believe that's still detrimental. Right. What's your opinion? Yeah, I think that's you know what I was saying with the subtle ways that parents do it. It's not just screaming at each other in front of the kids, but kind of these backhanded comments like, "Oh, your dad's still feeding you hot dogs for dinner. He hasn't figured out how to cook yet." Or you know, little things like that. These like little jabs that parents throw in that that kids are very aware of too. And what we always emphasize with this program is that the greatest gift you can give children during divorce is showing them that it's okay to love both of their parents and to be open about the fact that they love both of their parents. They shouldn't feel like they have to take sides. Okay? Um, are the strategies for the parents who are divorced, do you feel like that still can work with parents who've never been married but just been separated from Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, just any couple. Okay. It does right. get a little... I feel like it does, because maybe in a separating family, it's a little bit less final than a divorce. So like you were saying, getting back together might actually be more of a possibility. Mm -hmm. And so it's just be important, it would be important to, you know, navigate that with the parents. And so if getting back together is a possibility, don't emphasize the finality of it to the kids, I guess. And just. Mm -hmm. And then my concern is that they, since they give this power to the kid, the kids kind of recognize it, doesn't matter how old they are. <laughs> and then they want that power in every other thing their say in other issues, you know you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, I could see how that Because you've be. given them this certain amount of power in one sense or opinion, then they start opinionating everything that <laughs> parents do, you know, to a certain extent. They question everything. Yeah, it's definitely yeah. confusing boundaries yeah. for a child. Yeah. I have two more questions, but I'm so glad you asked. The first question is about the token system. Mm -hmm. What age, I can use, I'm thinking about like, adolescents and teenagers, when do you stop using the token system and what's a more appropriate system for older youth? Good question. When it stops working. So I think it depends. Um, I think these kind of things can evolve. The I'm sure you all have seen like the Barkley Manual for Parenting um, has suggestions on this kind of stuff. I have a kid right now as a client who's 12, but he's like an old 12, and we're struggling with this right now, like trying to find consequences and reinforcers that will fit for him. Um, and honestly, it's really hard <laughs> to find things that are actually reinforcing for him. So we've been doing, um, rather than like actual physical tokens, we just have like check marks on a calendar. Well, because his problem is school refusal. So when he goes to school, we're giving reinforcement for that daily. And then in the long term, we're using peers as a reinforcer, because really that's the thing that matters most to this kid is spending time with his friends. So if he goes to school every day during the week, you know, he earns up enough check marks, his mom will throw invite his friends over on Friday night, things like that. So it's really, I think, kid specific. I have two thoughts on this. One, I don't think that you can be too old to benefit from a token system. Um, you just have to find a reinforcer that works for whoever the person is. I've, I've done a token system for myself, stickers for exercising. <laughs> it works. Um, and one thing that you can do to make sure that it works for an older child is to involve the child in developing the system. So you can ask the child what rewards they want. I, I do it now with two 18-year-old clients I have. Um, and just asking them what would be rewarding for them. Because it's, it's hard for you to know what's rewarding for, for anyone. Um, you know, it might just be like going to get a soda or, you know, extra video game time or whatever. But they can contribute to coming up with these ideas. And so I think it can work for anyone. Yeah, I agree. Is it important to externalizers? What do you mean? Like having a calendar, having something that can see. Rather than just keeping them. track in your head? Yeah. I think so. I mean... You could keep track of your head, but I think having a physical, yeah. for most people, is important. Um, I mean, there's so many things that are based on that now. You know, like anything where you monitor, I feel like I've talked about it, like these, all of these diet apps, it's all about reinforcing and keeping a physical track so you can see and get rewarded by that. I guess it depends on exactly how sophisticated your system is, too. Like, maybe this isn't even really a token economy, but the way I have it set up with one of my kids is, 
um, if he cleans his room by the end of the day and his mom checks it at 4 p.m., he gets a soda. So it's, it's like this direct kind of reward system, but there are no actual tokens. Right. You can sometimes just use the direct reinforcer right, instead right, of a token. Right, right. Which actually can be important, especially for kids that are too young or not mentally capable of conceptualizing that this bean or whatever means a later reward. You can definitely be too young to get that. So I think it's depending, if the si system is really simple, you don't necessarily need to track it. But when it's like a complicated mm -hmm. thing. Exchanges and buying yeah. and. Do you have any, because uh, I'm uh, using a token economy, is there any good way to kind of wean kids out of it? Because um, I'm thinking that, you know, oftentimes when you use this, they become so used to having, getting some kind of rewards. Mm -hmm for behavior that you want them just to do kind of a, without getting removed, like removed. Because mm -hmm. so ultimately that's where you want to you know, mm -hmm. that's a really go with it. Well, I know that at least on the front end, that's parents. My most frequent thing that parents say to me of why they don't want to do a token economy is because these kids are supposed to be doing this anyway. These are not things I should have to be paying my child to do. Right, like giving them a soda to clean their room. I mean, right, exactly. Um, <laughs> exactly. Right. You're like, no, you should just have to clean your room. <laughs> yeah. Um, so in that sense, I usually just say, well, it's not happening how it is, so we're going to have to do something. But actually, I'm, I haven't ever weaned anyone off of a token economy. They just do it forever. <laughs> I mean, not forever. No, just, I think I'm you usually thinking, try and set up a token economy that is yeah. sustainable. Mm -hmm. So I'm just if they, they, you know, if they grow up, you mm -hmm. know, getting used to getting these rewards, mm -hmm. like, I'm not going to clean my room unless I get a soda. Mm -hmm. and, and what is then the reinforcer for them to keep doing that and installing that responsibility mm -hmm. to, you know, hey, I want to clean my room because I like it more when it's clean and, mm -hmm. you know, I'm in a better mood when I'm in a room that's clean. So, you know, the, right. the motivation for cleaning your room is always to get something. I think that something like yeah. a reward rather than the... The intrinsic you know, benefits. Yeah, exactly. yeah. It's yeah. What you, the ultimate goal is that you would like a child to have intrinsic motivations rather than these external motivations. And I'm thinking how that, you know, then transfers over to a I lot of I think that the logic is that through these external motivations that with development, a kid will eventually get to a point, so like, just naturally, where intrinsic motivations happen more. But that doesn't always happen, obviously. Yeah. I think you also want to use a lot of the catch and being good and the verbal praise and kind of integrate that into it so it's not just the tangible reward but they're also learning that you know this is a really great thing that they're doing mm -hmm. and then I think I actually have done this before we you start to make this system harder mm -hmm. so instead of getting a soda every night you could be like oh m man you're doing such an awesome job I bet you can clean your room for three days in a row and then get the soda and you just kind of like wean them off of it like that. And it's, I think it's also okay to reevaluate. So as the kid gets older, as situations change, to reestablish a token economy that's more doable. So yeah, it might be, okay, well, you know, I really think you're getting old and mature enough and now that I'm not going to give you a soda every time you clean your room because it's really not hard for you anymore. But, and then you still want to make sure they're still getting positive things in general. Aren't you teaching them how to be disciplined themselves? Mm -hmm. So as an adult, you want to give yourself rewards. So I need to go to work. And if I go to work these certain amount of times, I'm going to go out with my friends. But if I don't do this, I'm not going to reward myself. We're kind of like what Kelly was saying, working mm -hmm. out. I really don't want to do this, but this is a place I like to eat, but if I keep doing this, so you can be teaching the kids how to reinforce themselves. Mm -hmm. It would be an eventual goal. I think that's a good point, Henry, that especially when you get that pushback from parents that I'm paying my kid to do good things, you say, actually, no, you're teaching your kid that if you do things that are good, you'll get rewarded for that. That's how it is in the workplace. That's how it is in school. Um, and so I think it's underneath still a really good thing that they're learning. And it's good to emphasize that to parents who push back against it. Something that um, I thought tell a lot of parents that supervisor told me is imagine we all work. We work every day, Monday through Friday, 8 to 5, and then we don't get paid. <laughs> How would that make us feel? <laughs> and so I kind of relate that to the parents, say, okay, yes, I know, yes, we should go to work anyways, but if you weren't getting paid, would you want to work and do a good job every day? Mm -hmm. And I kind of explain that in the context of their praise. I'm giving the child a reward every so often because just as we, as we're adults, and we're pretty well disciplined, we're all here right now, <laughs> but I'm sure if we, were, if we didn't know that we would either get paid or this would help us for our future, we may not want to be here. So same thing, <clears throat> same thing goes for the kids. They need to know that there's like 
a candy waiting for them or a special activity. That's also a really great way to emphasize to parents that they need to be rewarding consistently. So if you're doing a token economy and they're not in fact paying out for these good behaviors, be like, if you didn't get paid, would you keep working? And it's, I've never seen anything be so effective in parents being like, oh yeah, I should be giving them that money. I do like getting paid. <laughs> and trying to focus on the behavior and not necessarily quality, but they are having a hard time saying what not to do. And I don't necessarily know how to kind of coach them through like this. So this is an example of you saying what you don't want, but what do you want? And they're just having a hard time. Because I know every time I leave a session, they go back to the old things and say, stop, 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 don't do that. Mm -hmm. Instead of identifying what they want. I mean, I think what you're doing, it sounds like you're practicing with them, which, especially if there's like ones that come up a lot. So I do that with families, like, oh, so what is the most common thing that's like whining is a lot. So what, in fact, are you asking that they do? So not whining, maybe it's, you know, ask for compromise or something. And so rephrasing it with them to practice. Um, I mean, I don't know I've, other than practicing. I've, yeah, session. I've had, um, I did in a session once, I brought like, I had them write down some of those no statements and then come up with the positive opposites like what they want to see instead so instead of saying and actually there's a worksheet in new beginnings that does this too where it's a whole page of, of don'ts and then it's like come up with the do's so just to get them thinking about what they want to replace the behavior with and I would also suggest just explaining maybe through an example for the parent that when you tell a child what not to do they still might not know what they're supposed to do if the parent can't even identify what it looks like, how's the child supposed to know what they're Yeah, just do, do nothing? Like, what is the expectation for a behavior that they mm -hmm. can do in that situation? Mm -hmm. Replace, because I feel like sometimes what happens, so don't yell, and then it's replaced with another also negative behavior. Mm -hmm. So I'm not gonna yell, but I'm gonna run around, you know, it's just, so say what you wanna be having happen. Do you send your therapy to the parents and recommend books that they read, and what would be a good book for parenting? Um, I generally don't. I mean, I know that it could be helpful, actually, in this sense, because there actually are a ton of, um, I don't know the names or anything, but there's a lot of resources on these kind of things for parents, because they work. And so, I mean, there's websites. Um, I don't have a name off the top of my head. Well, we use, Mikey and I both yeah. use worksheets from the Barclay, it's called the Defiant, it's Defiant Children, I think. I think it's Parenting the Defiant Child or something. Yeah that manual, so they have worksheets to give parents about token economies and stuff, so. So yeah, there's so. worksheets that come along, there's online resources too that you can print off and bring with you, but it's not so much a self-help book for a parent to use. Um, there's also the Oregon model, it's a similar, <laughs> I don't know who the author is, but it's um, parent, PM, parent management training Oregon model, and it's a very similar thing, they just have a few little tweaks there. Yeah, it's out of the um, social learning, wait, Oregon Social Learning Center, I think. I don't know who the author Oregon, is. The Oregon, state. the state. Yes. <laughs> not Oregon, <laughs> like your heart. Yes, not Oregon. <laughs> Oregon. And so, if you want to tweak it a little bit, that's a good one too. Yeah. When you reviewed the uh, divorce-specific strategy and uh, negative cycles, mm -hmm. I was thinking of children who say under three, but they don't have the verbal capabilities. Is it? Do you find that? You may have to remind the parent, you know, the acting out and the behavior they're seeing that might be new is that child's way of reacting to the divorce um, and what not to say or when to do things differently with them, um, you know, how to create a safer space or... Um, I do see what you're saying in the sense that for a younger child it's not going to look the same and maybe not be as obvious that this is a divorce-related thing. I also would caution on the other side of though, that I feel like parents sometimes when they're going through a divorce or something's happening, they're like, oh, everything bad that's happening with my child is because of the divorce. Or they'll bring them into you and be like, we get divorced, are they okay? Mm -hmm. And so um, I think it's just important to balance that. And yeah, so if you're seeing new behaviors, maybe think about what that could be about. Look at the triggers. In what situation is that child being, you know, whatever that new behavior is, and could you link that? But yeah. Yeah. yeah, I don't know much about that. The program um, is for kids 
three and up, so we don't really address um, what to do with younger children. In but I could see that what you're saying would be applicable mm -hmm. for sure. Like if I've, I've had situations where the child's asking for the other parent, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and to say, Dad's not coming back, I mean, that could be scary. Right. right. Or, yeah. or, you know, I, um, ways to allow the parent to be handling their anger internally, but also to have those cues of, oh, this is what I should be saying to mm -hmm. mom. Yeah, I think it's still the things apply with not, you know, putting the kid in the middle, like not saying those negative things like, oh, your dad's never coming back or something like that, but using the listening skills like the feeling responses, even with a two-year-old who's crying, whereas daddy, you can say, oh, you know, it, sounds, it seems like you really miss your dad, I understand, you know, just that comforting warmth, I think, is the way to go with that. Um, I think that's really just where the listening skills come in and, you know, being very clear and honest with your child and then giving them a space where they feel comfortable asking questions and expressing their feelings and just making sure that the parent is available to them for that. And that the other parent isn't using the new partner as another way to leverage, oh, your, yeah, your dad true. or your mom is such a bad person. Um, mm -hmm. Like, cause that's, I feel like that's just one new, it can actually be later. I feel like there can, some time can elapse and then if a new partner comes along, it's like this whole new drama in the relationship. So yeah, going back to the, the principles of don't put your kid in the middle is gonna stay really important. It might have not become an issue for a while and then surge back up. Right, yeah. Um, I really like these scales and I think it can be a lot of fun to you know, work with the parents and they can have a lot of fun with it. Um, one of the pitfalls that I've come across is it can be really tricky. Um, sometimes the parents can start to blame themselves. Like, oh, well, that means that the child's misbehavior is because of me or it's my fault. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you deal with that? That's an excellent point in the sense that if we're telling parents you have control over all these things through your parenting, they might internalize that and be like, oh, well, if I have control over it, it's going bad because of me. Um, I mean, I haven't actually had that many parents go that route, like, and really blame, although I guess a little bit. I've seen it more in the sense that things start going better, and they they really feel a lot of efficacy about that, but then, you know, there's always some setbacks or whatever, and then they feel like that's their fault. Mm -hmm. And so I just really try and emphasize, you know, that you're doing the best you can, um, you know, we're moving, like, really forward positive outlook, I guess, I don't know if that fixes it, but really, you know, we're not worried about the past and what happened. Let's just go move forward. You know, these are skills that help everyone. I think it also helps to emphasize that these are skills that literally everyone could benefit from. Me, when I'm a parent, will be using these skills and those will be helpful to me. And so it's not like necessarily something that you do because your kid is sick or has a problem. They're helpful to everybody. A lot of encouragement. Yeah, a lot of encouragement and just emphasizing that this is something that everybody needs. And so it's not like stigmatized to have to be using these skills. And I think also normalizing that everyone's going to Yes, exactly. Every parent, you know, regardless of the problems. So mm -hmm. No one's perfect. <laughs> no one's perfect and it's gonna happen. And there's gonna be setbacks and get them ready for that. Yeah, I think the normalizing and then also just emphasizing to the parents that they have skills that they can use and just, you know, reminding them you're here, you're working on this, you're aware that it's going on, that's already such a big step and you're willing to work on it and you clearly care about your child and just emphasizing that they already are doing something. Mm -hmm. And if you can, like if I'm sure there's something they are doing well already, really build that into whatever the new system is. Be like, oh, and you've already ha set up the system where such and such happens, that's great. And really build upon their strengths and emphasize that so that they see, oh yeah, I am a good parent. Being good. Yeah, catch the parents being good. <laughs> Give them some praise. And also, no, it's the little stickers. <laughs> parents stickers. And like a lot of times, um, I noticed this yesterday with one, of the, with one of the families, how there's so many things, especially with people that aren't client population. It's more than just they're having difficulty parenting. Yes. Right. <laughs> they don't have enough money to buy food. They're dealing with DES. They're CPS. They're Mm -hmm. A school teacher, there's always so many levels of the problem. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, yesterday I was with a client working on parenting skills, and she's like, Sorry, Pam, I honestly don't remember what you said last week. I'm so stressed out. About two hours ago, I got fired from my job, and she goes on to detail. And it's something that she could reverse because it's, you know, of course, CPS related. 
but there's all these layers. So instead of you know focusing, okay, we have to do this discipline today, you really focus on, you know what, look how well you're doing. Or look how far you've come in three years. And so yeah, you have to build them up, but also validate that they're human. And there's so many levels of what they're dealing with. It's not just parenting skills that they're doing. Mm -hmm. Could I please have a copy of the slides? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, thanks. I think it was excellent. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.